May 15th. I have seen him again leave the castle as he did before. Now that I know he's gone, I am free to explore with a lamp from my room. Passageways. Small courtyard. Most of the doors locked. But I found one at the end of a stairway that must have been forgotten by the Count. It seemed to be locked, but gave way with a little pressure. It led into an ancient part of the castle. An enormous room, but richly furnished. And the most inviting quarters I have yet seen in the castle. Huge windows overlooking a great valley. The moonlight was so bright, I hardly needed the lamp. Great comfortable chairs and sofas. Strings of cobweb hanging from the cabinets and chandeliers. And the dust of centuries on everything. But I found it strangely inviting. I sat for a moment near a window, looking out at the distant mountains, resting in the rich comfort of the scene. The Count's warning came to mind, but in the soothing moonlight, I took some tired pleasure in ignoring it. I had the feeling of belonging to those great days of times past what it must have been like to sit in ease and tiredness after the great battle in front of these, my windows, seeing out as I dazed upon my bus, the States. I may have fallen asleep. I was not alone. Three women seemed well, to be amused by my presence. They stood around me. <laughs> Mr. Harker. We waited for you. Ever so patiently. We knew you would come. Brilliant white teeth. Terrible red lips. Now you are our guest, my first. Yes, dear sister, we will follow. She was kneeling beside me, Young. bent over me, thrilling, uh, repulsive, yes. licking her lips like an animal. And then lower went her head to my throat. I could feel the breath on my neck. My skin, then touching, just touching, pausing there. Yes! 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 What about us? Uh, we have nothing tonight. What have you brought for us? What did you bring back? <laughs> there, in the bag. Oh, no. oh, yes. So warm and so bright. Oh. And as I look. They disappeared. They simply faded into the rays of the moonlight. Then, as the horror overcame me, I sank into unconsciousness. I woke up my bed. It, it was daylight. I, I tried to think... And then I ran, again, through the castle, to find a way out. But there was no one there. No one could hear me. And then it got done. 
again. I want you to write three letters. Three letters? One saying that your work here is nearly done and that you will start for home within a few days. My work is nearly done. Start for home. A few days. In the second, you will say you are starting out on the morning after the letter's date. In the third, you have left the castle and arrived at Bistritza. With the post so few and uncertain, it is best to have news of your safety on its way. To reassure your friends in London. Of course. You are quite right. What dates should I put on the letters? Yes, dates. The first should be June 12th. The second should be June 19th. The third should be June 29th. By then, I shall have concluded my business with you. May 28th. I wrote the letters. He has not yet discovered this journal. He wouldn't understand it if he did find it. It is entirely in shorthand. There were gypsies. They camped in the courtyard. I tried to get a message to them. Letters to Mina and Mr. Hawkins. But they returned them to the Count. He must have brought them here for some sort of employment. They have been digging in the cellar. Help! Help me! Please! Please help me! I am a prisoner here! They only laughed and pointed at me. I am in great danger! Help! Help me! Something the Count told them, perhaps? Then... they left. In carts. With large boxes filled with earth. Comfortable, Mr. Harker? Yes. I'm very comfortable. Have you written the letters? Yes. Yes, yes, they are. Very good, Mr. Harker. Sometimes, Count Dracula, it seems I... I can see the firelight through your body. Ah, illusion, Mr. Harker. The darkness and the shadows play strange tricks. I think I am ill, Count Dracula. May I see it, Doctor? Only tired, Mr. Harker. Go to bed. There is the surest cure. I must be about my many labors for my journey to your country, Mr. Harker. Sleep well. Dream well. In the morning, I discovered the door to my room had been locked from the outside. But there was at least a window. I could look out at the forlorn and desolate forest and at the walls of the castle. There below, the window from which I had seen him depart so many times. In my desperation, I saw also the great stones between his room and mine, most of them jutting out, wide enough to cling to, and a ledge that crossed the front of the castle. Just don't look down. Perhaps I can find the keys to the doors. One stone to the other. Holding on. Step by step until by some miracle and my own desperation. I reached the sill and the open window 
And finally, I stood inside. An old ruined chapel full of debris and coffins. Or boxes like coffins full of earth with covers open but ready for nailing. One box or coffin in, in the center was closed with nails in place for fastening. The Count lay inside on a pile of newly dug earth. He was either dead or asleep. His eyes open. No movement. No breathing. No pulse. On his lips, gouts of blood. It trickled down his mouth as if he had gorged himself. But he looked younger. His white hair had changed to deep steel gray and a mocking smile on his face. This was the monster I was sending to London. No. 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 I'd rid the world of him. A shovel. A shovel would be enough to crash the demon's head and that bloated face. <laughs> but the head turned. The eyes had a lover's look. The shovel hit only the lid of the box, which slammed shut and hid the horror from me. June 30th. These may be the last words I write in this diary. My door has been locked. My calls to the Ziganes would be useless. They are loading the boxes and taking them away for the long trip to London. Now, I am alone here. No. Not alone. Am I there now? Perhaps I could climb the castle wall from the window. To fall at least is better than to be devoured by those monsters. My darling Nina, I may find a way to escape from this dreadful place. I may find a way. <laughs> After the whole terrifying episode at the castle of Count Dracula, you shall presently hear. But we must take up now with the story as it was lived by my brave friends and my dear Mina, which began some weeks earlier. Our records for these events are all here in the journals of Dr. John Seward, and the diaries and correspondence between Mina and her dear friend, Miss Lucy Westendra. 
On May 9 of that same year, Mina writes, My dearest Lucy, I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be nice to see strange countries. I am longing to be with you at Whitby by the sea. Tell me all the news when you write. I hear rumors of a tall, handsome man. Arthur Holmwood. I've told you everything since we were children. So, dear Mina, I want to tell you everything now. We are in love. We will be married. You must come to Whitby immediately, and I can tell you all. It will help to have you with me while Arthur is away. We can walk every evening across the old abbey to the shore. Dear Lucy, I would feel so much happier for you if I were not so worried myself. For Jonathan? I haven't heard from him for a whole month now. Letters are always delayed from those remote places. At least you know he's thinking of you. Oh, he is. I'm sure he is. I shall ask Dr. Seward to visit us. That will distract you. Dr. Seward? Oh, that's the hardest thing to tell. He often comes to see Mother and I. He's a doctor, only 29 years old and has an immense asylum under his care. A, a lunatic asylum? Just fancy. Arthur introduced us. He's the most resolute man I've ever met, but calm, imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. Ah, and over you? No. Alas for him. Oh, dear Mina, that's the sad thing. But he was calm, as always. You mean he proposed? He didn't know about Arthur and me. When I told him how resolute and sad he was... And calm. He simply smiled, wished my happiness, and never mentioned it again. He told me a lot about his patients. At the asylum? Yes. One in particular who collects insects. Richard Renfield. Dr. Seward's patient to whom he now turned with more concentrated interest. A more curious case than many others in Dr. Seward's care. A sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom and elation, and some very strange habits indeed. You see how easy it is to catch a fly? That's because I'm kind to them. I feed them. See how well fed they are? But there are too many, Renfield. I appreciate your love for your pets, but many have escaped. They bother the other patients. You'll have to get rid of them. Ah, I will get rid of them. May I have a day? Yes, you may have a day. May I have two days? No more than two, Renfield. Good. I shall clear them away in two days. June the 5th. The case of Renfield has grown more interesting. He's turned his mind now to spiders, whereby his flies have diminished appreciably. But the spiders have become as great a nuisance as the flies. I find them in the closets. There are spiders in the dark everywhere. I'm very kind to them. Yes, I see they're well fed. Yes, they eat the flies. But now you have too many spiders, Renfield. I'm very good to them. I feed them every day. But there are too many. You must find another hobby. There are many flies. Only this time of year. And if you weren't so untidy with your own food, you wouldn't draw so many. It doesn't hurt when I hold them by the legs. See how well fed they are? Yeah, indeed. Watch, Dr. Seward. Renfield. Mm. Oh, Renfield, you ate it. It's very good. Very wholesome. But you ate it alive. Oh, yes, it is life, Dr. Seward. It is life. All animals eat life so they can give life. Well, I trust you will find some other way to get rid of your spiders. Oh, yes, the spiders. See how full of life they are. July the 8th. We are progressing. He managed to get a sparrow, and within a few days, a whole herd. The spiders have diminished, and the birds tamed. A very great favor, Dr. Seward. Well, what now, Renfield? Ah, uh, Doctor, a little playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed. A kitten? Why not a cat? Oh, a cat. Yes, I'd rather have a cat. A grown-up cat. Well, I'm afraid they won't allow it, Renfield. Oh, a kitten, then. I'll see about it, but I'm afraid they won't allow any animal. And what happened to the birds, Dr. Seward? He said he let them go. Well, I hope that was the end of it. I'm afraid not. He was very sick for a few days. I'm afraid he ate them, feathers and all. Oh, Dr. Seward, are there many patients in your asylum like that? No. Renfield's a peculiar kind. 
I've classified him as a zoophagus maniac. Oh, dear. What does that mean? Uh, life eating. He desires to absorb as many lives as he can. Many flies for one spider, many spiders for one bird. That's why he wanted a cat. But where would that lead to, Dr. Stewart? Yes. It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. To find out? I should like the secret of one such soul. How well the man reasons. He values life, you see. The higher the species, the more life it requires to feed upon. I wonder how many lives he values a man. Indeed. We want to show you Whitby Abbey, Dr. Seward. Mina and I walk every day to the Abbey. We pass the time waiting. Lucy for Mr. Homewood and I for Jonathan. Ah, yes, Mr. Harker. I am very anxious. Jonathan's employer received a note from him, only a line dated from Castle Dracula, saying he's just starting home. It wasn't like Jonathan. Castle Dracula? In Transylvania. Ah. Oh, dear, it must be that dog. Where do you suppose it is? Dog? From the Demeter, a ship that came ashore during the storm we had several nights ago. A terrible storm. It was all in the papers. Come over here, you can see it. We were watching from here. They were unloading what they could. Just boxes. There, you can see. But there are no shoals there. Oh, yes, I see. It's, it's simply grounded. Was there fog? No, a storm. The ship had been abandoned. Only the captain was found, tied to the wheel. And he, poor soul, dead for several days. A very strange story. A log was found. Something frightened them one by one to abandon the ship. You mean they threw themselves overboard? Something like that. It said it all in the log. What ship was it? A Russian ship. The Demeter. From the Adriatic. Demeter. The mother of Persephone. Ravaged by Hades. Ravaged? Well, she became queen of the underworld. Look, they're still unloading. Boxes. Yes, boxes of earth, they say. To London, they say. Oh, Miss Murray. They've gone out, Lucy and Dr. Seward. Ah, poor Dr. Seward. But, oh, Miss Murray, I did want a chance to talk with you. Believe me, Mrs. Westenra, I am eager for Lucy's happiness now. When will Mr. Homewood return? Oh, very soon, I'm sure. But I must speak to you about Lucy. What is it, Mrs. Westenra? It is her old habit. She has taken to it again, Miss Murray. Habit? From her father, I fear. A very troublesome affliction. But what? Walking. Walking? In sleep, Miss Murray. Lucy? My dear, there is, I fear, no cure. But also no immediate danger. Except walking on high places, of course. It has caused me, dear Mina, such anxiety. And I dare say sleepless nights. But I think there is little to fear. So long as she walks only to the garden and back. But while you are here, if you could lock the door and keep some watch on her bed. Oh, indeed, Mrs. Westenra. I dare say it is the waiting that disturbs her. For Mr. Homewood. Mina later confided to me her curiosity about Lucy's strange habit. What indeed had she shared with her father? What indeed in herself had, perhaps, brought her to the terrible fate that was to come? Lucy does walk. She tries the door, then goes about the room searching for the key. Lucy? Lucy, dear! Then she stands at the window, staring out at the ancient abbey. Another week gone, and still no word from Jonathan. August the 11th, 3 a.m. Tonight, she must have found the key. I awoke and found her bed empty. I knew of only one place she might be, Whitby Abbey and hurried there to find her. Fortunately, the moon was bright. I could see her sitting in our favorite seat near the east cliff and the great dark ruins of the abbey. A cloud passed over the moon and hid her for a moment. Then when she was visible again, there appeared to be a figure behind her, 
leaning over her. Lucy! Lucy! I ran to her, but when I reached the spot, she was alone. Oh. Mina? Lucy, my dear, here. Let me put my shawl over you. Let me help you. Now, stay sleeping. Just walk if you can. Mm. Look, just lean on me. Let me guide you. There. Oh. Mina? Oh. Oh. What's wrong? Why do you hold your throat? Oh, dear, did the pin from my shawl catch you? Oh, I'm so clumsy, Lucy, dear. No. No, Mina. It's all right. I'm all right, my dear. You must not tell Mama. Promise me you won't tell Mama. She went quietly to sleep then. I locked the door and tied the key to my waist. But I saw in my clumsiness I did wound her. Two tiny punctures on her throat. Fortunately, they cannot leave a scar. They are so tiny. As I dropped off to sleep, the moonlight shone through the window. A bat flew across the light back and forth. For a moment, it seemed to hover across the window. Its shadow darkened the room, so close that I could see its tiny red eyes before it disappeared. There, now. How pleasantly warm it is today. We shall have our tea out here. Has Lucy told you her good news? Good news? From Arthur? Oh, yes. From Arthur. His father is feeling better. He will return here. Oh, Lucy. Soon? Soon. And the marriage? Very soon. He says as soon as possible. It is a great comfort to know that Lucy will be protected. Yes, indeed. And we both would be happier to know the same for you, Mina, dear. Yes. Have you heard from Jonathan? No. N no word yet from Jonathan. I know I must be patient, but I wish I could be sure of his safety. Each night I'm awakened by Lucy trying to get out. I still have the key tied to my waist during the night. She goes then to the balcony. And stands there in the moonlight. I'm afraid to waken her. And it seems safe enough. She just remains there and I watch and sometimes doze off for a few moments. She appears to be growing weaker. I don't understand. She eats well and enjoys the fresh air, but the color in her cheeks is fading, and she becomes more languid day by day. Shall we walk to the abbey, Mina, dear? It will be lovely at sunset, before all the night sounds come. Night sounds? Oh, dear. I don't quite know, Mina. Dreams, maybe. Yes, you were uneasy in your sleep again last night. I wanted to be at the Abbey. I don't know why. I was afraid of something. I seemed to be sinking into deep green water. My soul seemed to be going out of my body, floating in the air, all about, over the ocean. I could see fish leaping out of the water. Then, as if I were in an earthquake, I saw you shaking me. <laughs> Uh, and you were shaking me to bring me back. <laughs> Lucy, these dreams leave you exhausted in the morning. You're pale 
And the little wounds in your neck haven't healed. Oh, that is nothing, I'm sure. Yet you hide them with your scarf. They are not healed, and it is all my fault, I fear. You see, they are still open and larger than before. The edges are faintly white. I shall insist on the doctor seeing these. In London, perhaps. London? Yes. Oh, Arthur sent word. His father is improving. He is driving there next week. So we will leave here. And then Arthur plans that we shall be married. Oh, Lucy, how happy you shall be then. Yes, we shall be very happy then. Miss Murray, my dear Mina, a letter for you. For me? From Jonathan? From London. It's addressed from Mr. Hawkins. Jonathan has been ill in Budapest. I am to leave immediately to go to him, to nurse him, to bring him back. Oh, Lucy, I'm to leave immediately. It doesn't matter anyhow. You can't keep me here. I'm going to get out of here. Those doors we saw it coming on, Dr. Oh, no. Seward. These last days he's been growing more excited, and today he tried to escape across the back fence. He fought like an animal. It's all right. I'll speak to him. Let me in. I'm not sure it'll be saved. It will be all right. Very well. I'll keep watch here. Renfield. I don't want to talk to you. You don't matter now. The master is at hand. Master? Yes, master. Master! Master! Oh! Oh! Dr. Seward, are you all right? Oh. Yes, yes, I may need your help to calm me. Get away from the window, oh, Renfield. You'll cut oh. yourself. You can't get out through the bars. Oh. Attendant, get a needle ready. Oh. oh, when the time comes, I will be free. Master! Down, Renfield. Calm yourself. The needle attendant, quickly. Here you are, sir. If I can just hold him still, it'll be oh, all master. right, Renfield. Master! Ah. Oh. Oh. All right, oh, Lieutenant. It acts master. very quickly. Help me get him into his bed. Right, right. Oh, Master. I shall be patient. But it is coming. It is coming. I shall be patient. In looking back, it is indeed curious that we were not more able to anticipate the events which Renfield foresaw. He, at least, was preparing. For the others... Count Dracula could be assured that his arrival would be uncounted and his victims innocent and unsuspecting. been listening to Bram Stoker's Dracula, the third in a six-part series adapted and directed by Eric Bowersfeld, and featuring Errol Ross as Jonathan Harker, Jenny Sterling as Mina, Sigrid Werschmidt as Lucy, Jeff Hoyle as Renfield, Drew Eshelman as Seward, Verona Seiter as Mrs. Westenra, and Eric Bowersfeld as Dracula. Technical production by John Rieger.